Hello, supervisors. Firstly, thanks for all of your work on the EPQ. I appreciate it very much, as I'm sure your students do as well. Now, to guide you with uh, giving feedback on the written report, I thought I'd make a screencast, and I can't do that for everyone's different report, but I can give you general advice that I think that you would find useful in this vital process of giving the students back the feedback that they're going to need on the first draft. And this is the only draft that you should mark. So what are we going to do today? Um, we're going to start off by looking at the idea of introductions, what should appear in the introduction, because if students get something wrong, it's usually almost immediately. We're going to be looking at the structure of the report, and AQA are very flexible on this, as I'll explain. We're going to look at the idea of chapters and sections. We're going to look at the idea that of arguments, not description. This is very, very key, and I'll go into more detail about it. We'll also look at the role of primary research, visuals and figures, referencing, which is absolutely vital on the EPQ. Obviously, our old friend SPAG, expression, syntactic and semantic errors. I'll say a little bit about that. And finally, I'll look at conclusions and the mark scheme, the EPQ mark scheme. So I hope that this will be useful for you. Now, firstly, looking at the introductions then. Introduction is absolutely vital. And probably the most important thing is that the research question is really key. Students need to make it very clear why they're writing. What is the purpose of the essay? And the key idea, of course, is that they should set up the debate immediately in the introduction. They should also give us a sense of why it's relevant, why it matters. This is something they can go back to in the conclusion, as I'll explain later. Any basic background could be covered in the introduction. So if they're doing a research paper on epigenetics, a basic definition of epigenetics or an unraveling of some of the more difficult elements of the um, the terms that they're going to be using. OK, but as I said, the most important issue to me is what will the report seek to achieve? And within the introduction, this should be signposted. Now, for any time you would like me to send you a EPQ report, uh, in your particular area that you're covering that's a good example, I'm very happy to do that. I'm not including that in the screencast because there are just too many different subjects for me to cover. Now, moving on, the structure of the EPQ report is incredibly flexible. If you do another exam board and not AQA, sometimes they give you a set format that they expect. AQA deliberately say that they are flexible in terms of the report structure. That said, there are a few key things that should certainly appear. So the first idea would be that there'd have to be some kind of review of literature. However, AQA say that they prefer the review of literature to be integrated into the essay as a whole and not as a separate part of the essay. So if a student is writing about, again, epigenetics, they don't want a review of literature before the student begins their own argument. They would like the student's reading to be integrated across the whole essay. The key thing, as I said, as regards with the introduction, there needs to be a sense of debate, not just the giving of lots of information. In the structure, there needs to be a clear sense of direction. It has to be purposeful. And so the question that you ask yourself as you are marking is, is the argument logical and flowing? As often students include unnecessary details, so you might want to suggest some cuts in a particular area, particularly if it's vast amounts of information that aren't strictly necessary to the essay. In terms of the structure, discourse markers are absolutely key. So students saying firstly, secondly, Next, I will go on to, and discourse markers really work together with transitions and transition paragraphs. I really encourage this in the EPQ classes at the end of a particular chapter to write. Next, this report will go on to discuss, etc. And to have little mini conclusions at the end of a, a section showing why this section was important. So that was really about telegraphing the question. I'm sure that history and English teachers are very familiar with this. But to the rest of you, it's the idea that every now and then the student might have a mini conclusion and show how that particular part of the report 
is useful in terms of answering the question. Now moving on. Um, chapters and sections. Now this is quite an interesting one because sometimes uh, the EPQ people don't like chapters. Personally I do. The reason why they say that chapters don't work is that sometimes it produces what they call a sectionalized effect. So that a student will have like one, two, three sections, and they seem to be quite separate from one another. However, I think in longer pieces of work, and bear in mind that this is 5,000 or 5,500 words, I think it's better for students to divide the argument into stages. And if they want to use subheadings for this, they can. The important thing is that the report must flow. And uh, that will establish cohesion. It will join the argument together. And the best way of making sure that in terms of these sections that they flow is to signpost, okay, so that the student explains very clearly to the reader what it is they're doing at the moment, what they're going to do next. So this really pertains to my last slide. This is something that in terms of the feedback where you could indicate where the report feels sectionalized, where it feels a little bit fragmented, how they might establish greater flow. That's a key element in terms of providing the student with uh, good feedback. Now, moving on. Um, argument, not description. Probably the biggest piece of advice that anyone will want to give will be this. Many students just give us a mass of data and facts and show off all of their reading. However, it has to be part of a wider argument. It cannot just be a huge splurge of information. So what I teach the students in the EPQ lessons is having some context is fine. And even if the first thousand words is just establishing all the important concepts that are necessary in order to understand the debate, that's fine, because that could be a place where you show your reading. However, after that, the majority of the um, report should be an argument. Now the reason why I've put Bloom's taxonomy up here is I teach the students this all the time. I ask them to pin it to their computer because obviously if they are just working in terms of description they are low down in terms of Bloom's pyramid. Okay, So we will want them up here doing this stuff, analyzing, evaluating, creating and to some extent applying. And the evaluation automatically comes if there is an argument because you are judging which argument is more effective. The analyzing will come from breaking things down. So it's another thing that you can look for in the report that they've actually explained things well and they've seen the implications of them. In terms of creating, well, arguments can be creative. And if you're doing an artifact report, it's very important to be creative. Okay. Now, these arguments can be tricky, especially in terms of science, because uh, there's so much information that the students need to explain. And it may, might be the case that some reports have more detail than others. The important thing that you have to look for is, is there an argument and a counter argument? And I make a great deal of effort as the coordinator to make sure that the research questions lead to a genuine argument and a weighing up of evidence. Okay. And then very importantly, and I'll talk more about this in the sources, are the arguments evaluated? And that can be quite challenging sometimes, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second now. Uh, the use of sources. Well, the students do um, a number of lessons on um, uh, the use of sources. We teach them how to reference, we teach them how to critically challenge them, and we teach them how to read them deeply. Now, I'm taking this from off the AQA website. Their exam report is usually quite scathing of the student's use of um, resources. Here um, in the last exam report, it says source evaluation tables were used by some students instead of a bibliography or reference list. So it's really important, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, that reference list ends the essay. OK, and they're scathing of the fact that students don't genuinely um, examine and critically evaluate the sources. That's why we teach them this CRAP acronym here, and you can get them to explain that to you. They should all know exactly what that means. 
they do say at AQA, some centres were encouraging students to evaluate sources in the report as a separate section. Once again, they don't like this idea of that being separate, just like the literature view. They would like it to be part of the flow of the essay. So in the middle of the report, students say, this source, however, may not be reliable because it's been sponsored by a petroleum company and they have a vested interest in this particular topic, etc. Or if it's a medical one, it might be that the source came from the pharmaceutical company. Or if it's a historical one, it might be that the source came from an ideologically conservative think tank. Uh, you want to make sure that the students are examining and being critical of the sources. Can't stress that enough. Now, in terms of um, primary research, AQA are often very critical of primary research. And it might be the case that when you read the primary research, you actually think it doesn't actually help the project at all. Students are often very keen to use primary research. It doesn't always work, however. So these are the questions I would ask. Is it needed? Secondly, is it ethical? Uh, AQA are very worried about uh, girls being asked about uh, eating disorders, or boys for that matter, um, or questions pertaining to mental illness or highly personal or invasive things. So that's something to consider. And we do teach ethics as part of the EPQ program. Is it valid? Have they done a good job? Have a look at the surveys. They're often terrible with very leading questions, etc. Once again, that's something that you might pick up earlier in your supervision of students. And very importantly, is it integrated with the literature review? So does it actually work alongside, as this triangulation uh, uh, diagram shows here, does it actually show how, whether the literature review contradicts their results or whether it confirms their results, okay? Here, um, AQA is saying much of it was poorly conceived. So it might be at this particular point that you decide that they have to take the primary research out or maybe go back in and reevaluate it. Okay, moving on. Uh, visuals. Visuals are extremely important and um, many teachers feel a little bit awkward with these, uh, but I am a strong believer in them. I think they're extremely valuable, especially for highly technical uh, subject matters. Um, they need to be very clearly labeled. Uh, so figure one, figure two, these figures should appear in the contents page before the report. And um, there should be a clear citation so that they should be cited just like you would normal critics. OK, and the actual report needs to um, refer to them and to use them. They shouldn't simply be there for decoration. So when you are looking at highly complex arguments, be they in something like philosophy or in science and physics, etc., having a diagram can visualize things beautifully. And some of your students will actually create their own diagrams and infographics. And I think that that's a fantastic thing to encourage them to do if they are capable of doing that. OK, moving on again. Um, in terms of referencing, I can't stress this enough. This is something that AQA look for very clear, uh, carefully. Students who targeting an A star and A should have upwards of 20 resources, uh, sources, okay? And some students go up to 50 or 60. All claims within the report need a citation. And this is very often a problem. So if you could identify some places where you can see students are not citing. So any kind of statistic or claim or fact that is not commonly known that could be uh, interpreted differently will need a citation. Now, most of the students will use the Harvard system, the author date system. If they're using quotations, the quotation does need a page number. If they're using Oxford and Cambridge, they need to have regular footnotes and the footnotes will require the whole citation at the bottom of the page or as endnotes. If the students are using internet sites, they need to include the date that they access the information. And obviously at the end of the piece, they need a very clear reference list or a bibliography showing all of their sources. Now, Spag and Lamwich, um, our old friend that will always be with us, it's not up to you to correct the report. That's not what you're there for. But you can encourage them to do things like spell check, um, to grammar check using Grammarly. It's not perfect, doesn't always work, 
but it is one way of perhaps looking at sentences. Um, sentence structure to me often seems the worst element of writing, in particular arguments which are not well sequenced and arguments which don't flow uh, with long spaghetti sentences. This might be something that you identify and often the cure for this is for students to go back to read their work really carefully and decide to use perhaps more simple sentences and to use more connectives and discourse markers. Again, this idea of flow will be really important. The vocabulary should be expert. Uh, the presentation uh, that they do later is for the general public, but the report is written for an expert audience. And AQA do say that to get an A star, you should be writing beyond A level. So the students should be attempting to use very technical vocabulary and to show expertise in the particular academic field. So at the same time, though, that shouldn't be uh, excessive. And it's a real gift that some academics have to show expert knowledge, but also not to really just, you know, require a thesaurus in order to understand everything that's written. So some sense of balance is there. An interesting one is personal pronouns. I would not use them in scientific reports at all. OK, so even in things like history, I would use them very sparingly. The use of the I is very controversial and has changed in recent years. My own preference is for students to use um, I only if they're writing within sort of more art subjects and even there to use them sparingly in terms of things like psychology and in terms of uh, social sciences and in terms of um, science, I would avoid them entirely because I think they don't look good. Our conclusions, these are very important indeed and students often um, underrate and underestimate how important they are, especially in terms of the mark scheme, which I'll show you in the final slide next. The key thing is to ask yourself, is there a genuine conclusion to the argument? Has the student at least attempted to answer the question? Now, they don't have to answer the question with a definite answer. Of course, they can hedge it and say it's a little bit of A and it's a little bit of B. But there does need to be some kind of answer, some kind of resolution to the debate. Of course, students can draw attention to the limitations of the research. That's really good practice. But the key thing is that they have tried to synthesize the um, the essay. So if we think again that the essay might have, say, three bits to it, one, two, three, it would be really useful in the conclusion for the students to say, we've looked at one, two, three, and I'm feeling that two is the strongest argument, etc. So there does have to be some real purpose for writing. The students shouldn't simply sit on the fence and have no opinion whatsoever. It's very important that they actually do decide on a particular position, okay? I think a very good practice is to ask your student to go back to the introduction to make sure that the introduction sets up the debate and that the conclusion finishes it. Another uh, nice two things to have in a conclusion is to go from uh, the local to the global. Uh, what do I mean by that? To show the wider significance of this. So if a student is talking about, say for instance, are psychopaths caused by genetics or are they caused by um, socialization? They could talk about, well, what are the implications of this for prison or for the justice system or something like that and show the wider significance. And the key thing is that there should be some kind of take home message at the end of the, the, the um, report. There should be a sense that the audience, the reader is going to get something from this. Now, finally, uh, the EPQ mark scheme, and then I'll finish this off. Um, what is really of valuable importance now is for you to remember that um, the student really uh, needs to think very carefully about the mark scheme and how to um, earn grades from this. Remember, uh, though, that the project will be marked holistically. That means it will be marked with the production log, the presentation, the report, and the appendices. So it's a whole story. It's not simply the report. Students should know that's something that I've, that I've pointed out many times to them. Now, in terms of identifying the topic, that's something that does appear in the report itself, okay? To complete the work uh, would come in the conclusion to some extent, okay? Problem solving and decision making 
um, is coming uh, inside the use of critical resources. Achieving planned outcomes is coming in the conclusion to the report. The use of resources is absolutely crucial to the whole report itself, okay? And communication skills also comes into the report because in this case, it would be like the quality of the writing. So I'll bring it to a close there. I hope that this was useful and it gives you some idea of how to give a student meaningful feedback. I'm always available to help if you need a little bit more additional advice. I hope that that was a worthwhile video. Thank you for listening.